guys, welcome back to um, the leadership series. We're starting section two today, which is leadership fundamentals. It's actually only three lessons, but I'm cramming them together. So this video might be longer, but it's pretty quick. So um, let's get into the first one, which is 2.0. Why have leaders? So we're going to go into scripture. God's strategy is Proverbs 11:14, advisor's guide to victory. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the Hebrew, counsel, the first time it's used, where there is no counsel, that is talking about direction, good advice, guidance. Okay? Now, then it said, with a multitude of counselors. Multitude is numerous, abundance. But the second counselors is an advisor a counselor, a chief or a leader, or a minister of a king that gives him counsel. So it's two separate concepts where there is no counsel, no good advice, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, so these are very wise advisors that are known to be advising people or they themselves are the chief or the leader, okay? Um, then there is safety. Safety is spiritual or physical deliverance or salvation. That's very interesting. Because it's not just safety from man or war or something. We're talking salvation. That's amazing. Okay. God's structure. Hebrews thirteen seventeen To obey leaders and to submit to them. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Now, one thing that I want to point out is you're going to be leaders. So this is going to be your task. So typically you might hear this and think that's about somebody else. This is about you. Think about this in terms of you. Because they keep watch over you, because you're going to keep watch over others, why? Because you have to give an account for those people you're taking care of, you're watching over. You're held to accountability for what happens with them, okay? So let's look at what having confidence in the leaders means and what submission means, what the people under you should be doing, okay? Confidence is to be persuaded to believe one's words, to strive to please, to be persuaded to do something because of belief and trust, and to comply because of confidence in them. So in order to have that kind of confidence out of people that you are helping, you have to give them a reason to have that confidence. And that reason is scripture. That reason is God. Always. It never comes back to you or your skills. Ever. Okay? Then... They should be submitting to authority, right? Submitting, submit, is to yield to authority, to surrender or willfully submit oneself to another and to resist no longer. That means they are going to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and just move on and do whatever it is you asked. Okay, yes, I'd love to help you. Now, God's diverse layers of leadership. We've got Romans 12, 4 through 8. There's different traits and there's different jobs for all the different things. But you know what? Each one is its own type of leadership. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be speaking in front of people. It doesn't mean everyone is going to be um, healing people. But everyone has a role to play. And that role is in leadership over whoever it is they're helping. Okay? So, for just as each of us has one body with many members... And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I want you to take note that when you're leading, you need to do it diligently. Because that was pointed out as a how-to. Okay? 
Now we're going to start lesson 2.1, which is who chooses the leaders. Okay. Jeremiah 1, 5, before the womb, this prophet was appointed as a prophet over the nations. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So in the Hebrew, to set you apart, that means to be sanctified, to be consecrated. Jeremiah was consecrated and sanctified by God before he was even in the womb. Okay. Now it says that I set you apart and I appointed you as the prophet to the nations. This is interesting because it says appointed is to see over, to appoint over, a leader over people. Okay? So the parsing of this, the very specific way it's used is to mean I ordained thee. So basically, that's like saying, I anointed you. I ordained you to be over these nations. So who is choosing the prophet? God is, right? And that's not different from any other leadership role. But we're going to keep hearing more. Acts 20, 28. The Holy Spirit makes the overseers. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So the Greek for has made, because the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the Greek is to set, to put in place, to make set or to set for one's use, to establish or ordain. This word is in the second aortist, middle indicative, third singular parsing, which doesn't mean much to you, but what it means is this word can only be used in this one specific way that I'm going to tell you, okay? It means the emphasis is on the action. So what's the action? Being made an overseer, okay? And, and the idea that the action occurs is a fact. So no matter what happens, this event of being made an overseer happens, period because the Holy Spirit ordained it. The Holy Spirit anointed that to occur, okay? Now, Romans 13, 1. Authorities are appointed by God. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Appointed in the Greek is ordained, appointed to be assigned to a thing. Uh, this parsing... This very specific way that we have to use this word because the way it's written in the original only means that this verb, what's the verb? To be appointed, right? Was done for all and the subject is the recipient of the action. So that means we are all appointed by God to do a certain action. What is the certain action? To be submissive to governing authorities. Now, 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1. leaders are chosen by God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is a known leader, and he was chosen by the will of God. Okay, The will of God is the purpose of God to bless mankind through Christ and the commands or choice or desire of God. Then it says, according to the promise of life. What does that mean? According to in the Greek is down from or of the end aimed at proclaiming life at which something has a tendency toward. So the will of God chose a leader. Why? To get to the end aimed. What is the end aimed? As many people as possible saved. So that's why leaders are chosen by God. Uh, the summary of that verse is for the larger will that all are offered and could choose the promise of eternal life through Christ. God chose Paul, a leader, to be the apostle to bring that goal aimed at to the people. Arguably, the Lord is the one who chooses each person's DNA okay, and shapes their life experiences. This makes the leaders develop into leaders of who he wants to use. And then they will bloom with the proper skills, the proper traits, and the proper life choices to be worthy to lead. So 
In the life of a leader, God's hand is always in the middle of it. All right, now we're going to go on to section 2.2 of this Leadership Fundamentals, which is Maturity for Leadership Eligibility. You can't just be a leader if you're a baby Christian, okay? You have to have some maturity. You have to have gone through some traits and some things, some tests of your faith. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be as mature as someone who's been a Christian 50 years or 30 years or even 10 years if you're a new Christian. But you will have more maturity than someone who just became a Christian if you just became a Christian a month ago, okay? Here's the maturity that is expected um, in Scripture, okay? 1 Timothy 3, 6, not a new Christian, meaning mature, not a novice, um, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Whoa, that's heavy. So novice in the Greek is a recent convert or newly planted. So if you're too young of a Christian, it's okay to follow. You can share Christ with other people, but you should not be in charge of large groups of people because you could earn pride as a, as a result. And then it says, and fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Well, what's the devil's condemnation? That's to burn in the lake of fire forever. So it's very important that you are a step above a novice. Okay. All right, then we've got Titus 2, 1. Leaders need to teach proper doctrine. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. How do you know proper doctrine? You have to read, study, and memorize a lot of scripture. And then you have to take some time and think, how does this fit together? Is this working? Does this make any sense? Joshua 1, 8. Your mind, your mouth, and your lifestyle need to be centered in the word. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Romans 12, 2, be shown responsible and obedient. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So right now we're looking at the renewing of the mind. What is renewing? It's a renovation, renewal, a complete change for the better as affected by the Holy Spirit. So this is the process of sanctification, the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, right? So prove is to test and recognize as genuine after an examination or to approve as worthy. This means you have to go through some tests in your life to prove that the gospel and the Bible and grace and all the words that are in the Bible are true because it's been witnessed through you living it out. It's been witnessed by answered prayer. It's been witnessed by you being able to hold on. Then we've got that is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Good is upright, honorable, excellent, distinguished, and joyful. Acceptable is well-pleasing, acceptable, and fully agreeable. And perfect is perfected and bright to its end perfect in human integrity and virtue, necessary and nothing lacking to be complete and perfect. And then we've got Matthew 13, 12, more is given to the obedient. For whoever has to him, more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This means if you're a new Christian and you get a test and you pass that test, you get to get bumped up. Basically, you get more information. You get more wisdom from the Lord. You get opportunities to lead. Okay. And then if you are not keeping with what you're supposed to be doing, you're not going to be able to earn the position of leadership. I've got a chart here that summarizes um, the traits and there's verses on the right um, that I'm not going to read but you are welcome to look up so you can get a better understanding. I've only summarized what these traits are in each verses and then put them in this chart for us. And I'm going to bust through this chart real quick. First, I'm going to show you all the verses so you can screenshot if you need them. 
And then I'm gonna bust through the list because the screen frame will not hold the whole thing so you could read it. So here's the verses. And in the section of God and Jesus words, a baseline maturity for a Christian to be eligible to lead, be doers of the word, delight in the Lord's law, meditate on God's words day and night, hide the word in your heart, hope in his word, stay up late at night to meditate on his promises. In the section of prayer, for leaders to be eligible to lead, rise before dawn and cry out for help. Ask God in faith for wisdom. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Cast your cares upon God. Number three is the pursuing of holiness. That is to be profitable in this life and the next. The next one is spiritual fruit and responsibility. Selfless, humble, watch out for the interests of others, love without hypocrisy, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, kind and affectionate in brotherly love, give preference to one another, be diligent, fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulations, distribute to the needs of saints, be hospitable, bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind, associate with the humble, not wise in one's own opinion, live peaceably with all men, feed and give drink to your enemy, overcome evil with good, keep your heart with diligence, trust in the Lord with all your heart, in all your ways acknowledge God, follow his directions for your path, fear the Lord and depart from evil, honor the Lord with your possessions, honor the Lord with your first fruits, walk circumspectly and walk in according to the Spirit. So these are the things you should be aiming at because you will be leading. So you need to try and pray and ask that you are like achieving these goals. Now, section 2.3 is qualifications of leaders. Okay. Now these are biblical qualifications, right? And I'm going to show you some things, but God is always at work though. We cannot see it preparing people. He has chosen for leadership. When the crisis comes, God fits his appointee into the place ordained for him. This was written by Oswald Sanders. Now, God's leadership qualifications are not based on the world's standards, but based in character, faithfulness, obedience, willingness, love for him and his word, and a strong desire to spread the gospel as well as care for the people inside and out of the church. Of the pool of people that have spiritual maturity and of the pool of people who have had life-shaping experiences, traits and skills given, the Lord looks for a willing person um, to represent him and his mission. This is exemplified in Isaiah when he was chosen as a prophet but the required willing spirit does not only apply to prophets, but all workers and especially to leaders. As a leader, you give up many things. And the Lord only wants leaders who willfully want to choose to serve cheerfully. Whatever they have to give up, they have to give up. Doesn't matter. So Isaiah 6, 8, willful, voluntary availability. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. You should have that crave in your heart. Here I am, send me. Yeah, I want to lead. Yeah, I can't wait till this thing gets going because I want to do this thing, right? That's, that's, that's a leader. Now, I'm going to give you the biblical traits, attitudes, and lifestyles of leaders. This is a chart. You may not hold an official leadership title that is listed in the Bible, okay? In fact... 99.9% .9 chance you're not going to because the church is going to be structured in a new way for the very end times. It's not going to be in a building and we're not going to need to like pass the communion plates. Okay. It's going to be very different. So I'm going to show you some traits that are connected to leadership in general. And those can be applied in general 
to what we must do, what we must act like to other people in the church and other people out of the church. Okay. These are traits and behaviors that God expects from leaders in general. And this should help us focus and weed out anything in our lives that we need to get rid of. Okay. Um, if you have something you see that's a hindrance, just pray over it. Have communion. Ask the Lord to take it away from you. Okay. So the first position that is evaluated in the Bible is the bishop. Okay. So the official title for the uh, bishop is Episcopae which is God's gracious care, the office of the overseer of a Christian church. So this is like they're in charge of that building in that city, okay? These are the things that must occur. They have to be blameless. They have to have one wife. They have to be temperate, which means patient, uh, sober-minded, of good behavior, able to teach, gentle, rule their own household well. Children are in submission with reverence, they are good testimony to outsiders. They're a steward of God. They're hospitable. They're a lover of what is good, just, and holy. They're self-controlled. They hold fast to the faithful word taught in sound doctrine, exhortation, and conviction. They handle contradictions properly. Now, what they must not do or have is be given to wine, violent, greedy for money, quarrelsome, covetous, a novice, that means a brand new Christian, self-willed, quick-tempered. And we know that that's over the church. And here are the two passages where I got those words to put in this chart. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7 and Titus 1, 7 through 9. Dealing with the elder, it's called the presbyterios. And it means to be among Christians, those who preside over the assemblies. So an elder is someone who is helping the general people that go to church. Okay. And they are there to be blameless, husband of one wife. Their children are faithful. Their children are not accused of dissipation. The children are not insubordinate. Um, they stop and rebuke idle talkers, insubordinate and deceivers. These, this position was in every city, and this was from Titus 1 5 and Titus 3 1 to 6, 11 and 13. Now, again, you're not going to necessarily be a presbyter, you're not going to be an elder or a bishop, but that doesn't mean that God has a different standard for people that are in charge. So, you need to just think through what am I thinking about? What am I looking at? Is do I match up? Then we've got deacon, diakonos. Um, one in the church that it has the charge of caring for the poor, distributing the collected money, and is a servant. Okay, so he must be reverent, beholding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Um, first, be tested and found blameless. Be of one wife. Rule the children well. Rule the household well. Be in good standing. Great boldness in the faith of Christ. Later, it also says that his wife is reverent, temperate, and faithful in all things. Not. You cannot be double-tongued, given to much wine, greedy for money, and his wife could not slander. First Timothy 3, 8-13. through Then we've got they, leaders are to be able men. Okay, this is actually from the Old Testament, Exodus 18, 21, and it's a yill which is strength, wealth, ability, force, valor, and military. So these are able men that can fight. And with a parallel, we are the men who fight, okay? Because we're fighting in the spirit constantly, or should be. These men must fear God, be of truth, and hate covetousness. Okay, faithful men, which are referred to in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, this is pistos, which is believing in the New Testament, Jesus, salvation, and objectively trustworthy. Okay? They must be able to teach the Pauline doctrine, and they must endure hardships. Then we've got tribal leaders. Uh, in Deuteronomy 1, 13 and 15, it says, it talks about choosing tribal leaders. And this is um, Sebet Ross, which is the staff holder, the chief man, the leader. So they need to be wise, understanding, and knowledgeable. 
Now in this one, it talked about tribal leaders and then the different types of divisions. This is where all can serve. If you have faith in God and you are still here, you will still all serve because take a look at what's happening. There are people who are going to be heads over people, leaders over thousands, leaders over hundreds, leaders over fifties, leaders over tens, and officers for the tribes. So these are all different kind of categories, but they are still expected to be wise, understanding, and knowledgeable. Then we have apostles, which is a delegate sent forth with a message. Eminent Christian teachers are called this in the Bible. So Acts 6, 4 points out that they must be given continually to prayer. We're talking a ton of prayer, people. Given continually to the ministry of the word. The position of being young or youthful in age. 1 Timothy 4.12 and 1 Peter 5.5 5 talk about young but mature Christians. So they must be an example to the believers in word, conduct, spirit, faith, and purity. They must submit themselves to the elders and they must submit, be submissive to others and humble. And, but it does say, do not let anyone despise you. You know what that means? You can't do things that make people hate you. So that means you have to use wisdom. Shepherds and overseers. They're actually the same category as an elder, okay? But I'm gonna use it here separately because they're, they're talked about in this wordage. So the shepherd is um, to tend and feed a flock, to govern, to supply the requirements for the soul's needs. And the overseer is to look over and care for the church as an elder. We already had the category of an elder, but this gives us more information. And this is super interesting because it says that we need to shepherd God's flock among you and serve willingly and eagerly, be examples to the flock, submit to God, resist the devil, heed to the flock, shepherd the church of God, diligently know the state of the flocks and attend to the herds. And we could not, if we were a shepherd or overseer, serve by compulsion or as lords over people. Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now, all of the people that are gonna be coming to Christ are sheep, okay? and you are gonna to have to shepherd them on a small level. And you will need to do the exact things that are here. Submit to God, resist the devil, that's fighting in the spirit that I'm gonna teach you some tips. Um, and you will have to diligently know them. You will have to know how to minister to them, okay? And help take care of them until it's time to go. So this is 1 Peter 5, 2 to 4, Acts 20, 28, Proverbs 27, 23 to 24. Then we've got servants, which is one who lives in the same house as another and are under the authority of one householder as a domestic servant. Any servant, we're serving God constantly in his house, okay? Submissive with fear, endure grief. Fear is not fear like I'm so scared. Fear is respect, okay? Submissive with fear, endure grief, suffer wrongful treatment with endurance, obedient to his own master, well-pleasing in all things, showing fidelity. This servant must not answer back and not pilfer or steal, okay? And then men for daily service. This is people who execute the commands of others, the positions of a Christian teacher, a deacon, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, an elder, a Christian teacher. This will apply 100% to you because you will be teaching other people about Christ and about the plan to come. This is, you must have good reputation. You must be full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom and full of faith. Acts 6, 1-4. And then a king, 2 Chronicles 1, 10 to 12, it says, um, Malek, which is a royal king, they must ask the Lord for wisdom and knowledge to judge and lead. Now that's not bad advice. You're gonna lead, ask the Lord for wisdom in your personal situation. Because you may be in a war zone. You may not be in a war zone. You may have people that are in poverty. You may have people that are super rich. Everyone's details are gonna be different. So you need to ask for wisdom because he knows and he'll give it to you. Okay, so let's look at this graphic that draws together all those scriptures in review. 
The question is, why have leaders? So if we look at the top, we have God's strategy, which is victory. And parallel to it is God's structure, which is obedience. So following God's victory down, we have who chooses the leaders. So we know that God chooses and appoints the leaders and the Holy Spirit makes the leaders. So we are, so the leaders are made by the Holy Spirit. Now, when the Holy Spirit makes a leader, they are causing them to obey, okay? Bringing them into obedience. Now, going back up to God's structure, obedience, we have to understand that through his structure and obedience, there are certain jobs that God has, right? So we were told there's prophet, teacher, encourager, servant, a merciful person, and a giver, as well as a leader. We're focusing on the leader. The leader is said to be diligent. Remember, I said to remember that, right? Diligence is another way to say obedience. Okay, then there is the biblical eligibility that we talked about. So it said you had to not be a novice. So it needs to be obeyed that a novice is not leading. Okay, then um, teach proper doctrine. Be of mind, mouth, and life biblically centered. Then be shown responsible and obedient. It said to whoever has obeyed, more will be given, right? Those, all those concepts lead right up to obedience. Then we've got biblical qualities to be willful, voluntary, and availability. That's what God works with. But it said many, many traits, which I cannot fit on this graphic, but you can go back and look at that chart. Many traits living out the biblical rules. What is that? That's another way to say obedience. So if we span out, you can look that God's victory and God's God's strategy and God's structure, this includes who he chooses, what the jobs are, eligibility, and the biblical qualities. They all come back to the central focus of obedience. Leaders have to be obedient if they're going to be seen by God as doing it properly. So here's your end times tip. If you obey God's words and have true faith and you're praying, like has been said, a hundred times in all those prophecies, by default, you will be protected and provided for. And that automatically puts you in a leadership role. So basically, if you obey the commands that you were told to do, you will become a leader because leaders obey. At this point, we are done with that entire section. I know it's a little long today. But hope you've learned a lot and um, see you next time.